It is April the 15th, 2023, and this is the future of photography. Where is the intro? Here is the intro. The future of photography. <laughs> oh, well. I <laughs> fixed it in post. <laughs> Bumpy start. I will not fix this. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> ah, welcome back, everyone. It's the three of us again. Adrian, Jeremiah, and me. How's everyone two and, doing? Two and a half, if you count my, my internet connection, oh, which yeah, may or well, may not drop out halfway through the podcast. A it's Adrian and I are on the road, so we are away from our home uh, studios. Hey, Does but modern technology, everything is fine. If someone drops out, we'll just continue without them. So, <laughs> leave and me on, the, back. on the upside, I went to the beach today and had a splendid time taking lots and lots of photographs. So, well, there you go. I, I've so been living the dream we, today. We doubly appreciate that you took the time to join us here on the show. We will be assimilated. That's the title. What will we be assimilated by? Well, I think we're going to be assimilated by the future. <laughs> and the future, oh, no. The future is integrating um, a lot of tools that we assumed were best for editing photographs have now created uh, a lot of adjuncts, um, a lot of integration that work with AI and for AI to create AI and use AI uh, isn't it interesting? Photograph. Is, isn't it interesting how things have? I mean, AI has been in like Adobe products for the longest time, for years, yeah. in mm -hmm. some shape or form, mostly to, I don't know, figure out what the subject is and make selections and these kind of things. But that is getting a bit more involved now. You can yes. argue that it's been hard coded into fo camera firmware for fifteen years now. You know, so you know, your, your big high-end DSLRs from 15 years ago that started including databases so that they could assess what kind of landscape, what kind of composition you were finding and get the get the exposure right. Yeah, that, yeah, that was but touted is that, at the time as AI. That wasn't AI, no. <laughs> well, well, what is AI? We, uh, well, it's, it's a way of processing information. Let's just call it simply what it is. Uh, the interesting thing is... Are sci or have scientists been using computers to model and create film, actual f film? In other words, Fuji's coming out with a new film, I heard. Um, you know, there, there is development on film, just as there are developments on chipsets. They all interpret or interpolate what we see with our eyes. Uh, in different ways to create a different result, i.e., you know, you shoot a picture on Tri-X as opposed to an old Kodachrome, as opposed to Ektachrome, Fuji, etc. You're going to get different images, all things being equal. The development of those probably integrated computer science in developing the kinds of um, output and chemistry that would be useful for it. Now, one could argue that that is the inception of artificial thinking uh, early on in the photographic process. Discuss among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 I, I think I think the, the the whole definition of artificial intelligence. I mean, if we break it down, it used to be the thing is somewhat smart um, in a very very limited, very narrow. Um, field Definition, and yeah. uh, th this has now with with machine learning, with deep learning, and all the all the different uh, terms that have come up over the last ten years, probably or have been intensified. Uh, that definition has changed, and it's now a specific way of of um, retrieving information from this diffuse cloud of yeah. uh, of of, of, right. of multi dimensional matrices. So we are looking at a different kind of artificial intelligence now than we used to look at 10 years ago. Well, I, I think we also um, s seem to think that intelligence um, is something that is positive, that that it is smart in ways that are good. But that's not necessarily the truth because we know humans are flawed. Humans created these things or certainly designed them up to a point. Um, before the machines take over completely. But 
So all our um, flaws, be it our, our way of seeing the world, our misinterpretation of data, um, our you know, our anthropomorphizing of you know um, machines or, or inanimate objects, all of that contributes to basically the flaws in the machine, and those dark flaws in the machine probably are balanced with all the benefits that come out of the machine, just like humans. Does that make them smart? Uh, well, they're capable of solving problems, but as many um, scientists uh, would define AI is their basic use is to convince you <laughs> that, that what they're delivering is true, is real, uh, but they don't know anything about intelligence, really. There's not that self-aware. It's not. We haven't reached the age of spiritual machines yet, though. Yeah, I could argue we're getting there. <laughs> so, sounds that that's that sounds like a scary thought. But um, back down to earth, and especially back to photography, we are looking at yeah, integrated uh, AI integrated into photography tools. So, what are the tools that you use that that do these kind of things? Uh, you know, for me, and I'm asked this constantly in the output of my work, uh, you know, what tools do you use? And, you know, I, I, I use tools. I mean, I have a long list of tools. I mean, we could start with um, MidJourney is, is the foundation of my sort of artificial intelligence work. So that's, that's creation. That is making art. Making, yes. Uh, Photoshop, however, is also um, a tremendous... Uh, useful editing tool for me. I've been using it since Photoshop 1. So the new uh, versions of Photoshop integrate neural filters. They're still considered beta, but they they are amazing. They, they mask easily, but they also will address JPEG blocks uh, to reduce them. So there is a certain kind of artificial sharpening. Um, there's ways of changing the direction of, of eyes to the side or, you know. To, so these are things where you take a, a, a picture of, you know, your kid and he's looking that way and you can have his eyes looking that way. Um, and it's still the picture of your kid, but it is, is now it been... Is it still? Is it still? That's one of the well, questions. Yeah, that's can right. I, I can think I ask we... which bits of these are, are, are actually, uh, you know, what we mean by intelligent? So... In the work that I do outside of photography, where I do a, a lot of work at the moment with, with so-called AI, um, the one of the definitions is that the the software has it, the ability to learn. Okay, so sometimes there are um, sometimes there are algorithms and they're just static. Sometimes those algorithms uh, have been through a learning process, a training process based upon lots of uh, of data. But then when they are deployed, they are static. And other times there are algorithms that are deployed that can learn on the job. So are you so, talking about AGI, which is... No, 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 no. This general. is all very narrow band still. Okay. This is all narrow AI, certainly not general intelligence. But let's say, let's say your I algorithm, um, let's say uh, that that has been trained. So it's been trained on masses and masses of data so that it knows and, and that the algorithm is good because it's been trained on masses of, uh, of images of eyes. So it knows how to generate a realistic looking eye uh, you know, using software or to, to process the eyes that are in the image and, and apply it in, in a different way to make it realistic. That's different from a piece of software that would learn about how you like to edit based upon watching you for six months and then making suggestions to you based upon what it's watched, watched you doing. So what, what is it that we're seeing in Photoshop? What kind of, uh, of learning does Photoshop have available to it? Chris, you want to take that one? Well, I, I'm I'm very sure that we are looking at the, at the static variety at this point. So um, the, the 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 models are being trained on big amounts of data, and we've talked about this. How, for example, how Adobe gets this data because they they are now tapping into their stock um, service for well, everything, training. Yeah, surely everything everybody records to the cloud, they they'll never admit it, but they're going to have trained it on everything. They they they. 
They clarified that. They did clarify that, uh, especially, especially when people started asking that a, a month ago or so. Oh, what did um, they and, say? I missed that one. And they said, we, we are, we're not using the, the general stuff in the cloud. That is not part of it. Um, but um, they now said on their latest big event, they said that uh, they are um, definitely using the Adobe stock, stock. The yep. stock, Adobe stock. And they are also at least thinking about a model to compensate the people who uh, provide the stock that will be trained on. So sure. anyway, oh, different so, story, so, so different story. The, the, we, I, find, I find that really interesting because, yeah, we're talking about right, the future and where this is going. Yeah? So yeah, people who work with these algorithms know that the data you train them on, and, and we hear this a lot in the news, but it, it, it really is true. The, the, the better the data you train them on, the better they will be. And you don't have to stray very far away from real world uses pat usage patterns before your training data set is, is very suboptimal. It's almost like an inverse square law, you know, like for lighting a photograph, right? Yeah, very it, true. It, it's, yeah, so, so, so you know, uh, you, one could argue, right, that stock photography is not a good training data set for real world stuff that people actually do. Now, that might be that I'm just a bad photographer, right? And I can't shoot to the quality of stock photography. <laughs> but so, so, so the, thing, the thing is that Adobe has one important goal, and that is to keep advertisers and other companies who use their services happy. And that means they need to be safe for people to use because of all the copyright issues and things that come with training data sets. So that is oh, one yeah. of the reasons they do that so that they can, they can keep selling um, those products and the services uh, connected to them to their customers that will then work for other customers. Well, so, that, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, th there is um, the growth of artificial intelligence uh, integrated with very simple editorial um, conversions of a photograph. In other words, working on voice, make my photograph a little bit brighter. Uh, can you darken the sky? Uh, can you pull out the highlights in the skin tone? Like those kinds of things, add a little highlight to the eye. This is coming extremely Soon. I mean, I, I would predict this in the next several months that we're going to see that integration. And it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Adobe integrates that. They just sent me, I've been, ex they just gave me a beta on one of their new tools. I haven't even, it just arrived in the mail yesterday. I didn't um, check it out. But, but they are actively focused on um, how to make photo editing easier the the blade runner enhance scene exactly the famous right. blade runner enhance scene is is very is, is just around the corner it's not far yeah. off pretty much that's, yeah. you know, that's that's, if i remember correctly blade runner was set in 2019 i remember was being it? quite quite upset on back to the future day that i didn't have a flying skateboard i think that was 2015 and, on, and, and, 20, and in 2019 i didn't have a flying car either um, but maybe maybe the, the the Blade Runner enhanced thing was only a few years out. <laughs> I, I, have, I'm, I have high hopes there. But back back to back to your original question about are we looking at a static or a self learning thing? This is static. This is trained on data, and then that gets uh, executed in in uh, in machine learning parlance. That's in, in, the infer inference of the object. Uh, the inference of the model happens on the machine locally, maybe on some service, because some of these things might be a bit too uh, yeah. too difficult to do on a local processor. So there might be some cloud stuff. The same way you your, your Siri goes into the cloud to transcribe your voice, um, that, that kind of stuff happens there. Siri's an interesting one. Can we pick, can I ask It's a hybrid, that, actually, it's a hybrid. We're talking, well, we're talking about integration of AI, right, into the tools yeah. that we use. And Apple have got a bit of a problem, I think because they have worked for very many years on, you know, uh, uh, to advocate for privacy, right? We can discuss how well they've achieved that or whether they really meant it or not. But their, their marketing certainly has been, you know, the processing happens on your device. So those of us that have Apple devices um, and, you know, it recogni they recognize people's faces and you assign them a name and it goes, and you'll notice that actually the photos that come up against a certain person on your MacBook will be different from the ones on your iPhone because that 
that processing happens locally on the device and yes. it happens, you know, it, it's staggered and it gets different results and things like that. So, so you know, the, the challenge, one of the, one of the challenges that Apple is going to have is how do you do AI on what you would call edge compute, right? So ed, where edge compute just means you have a, a low amount of compute power available to you uh, and you have to do the processing with uh, that low amount. Yeah, because I, if they I, backhaul I, it to servers, then their their the privacy I, goes, doesn't it? Go ahead. You, you know, you know what we're looking at uh, right now is the, the 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 most enormously big amount of research that is going on into these things in the most in the absolutely shortest time. The the amount of innovation that's happening right now in that field is so staggering, and one of the results is that you can now run large language models on your on your laptop because they found ways to distill them down to make them to, to compress them down without losing too much functionality so uh, there's something I'm, else though uh, there, there's the you know the the financial model which i think is is small models that are very specific that one could license uh, i'm i'm experimenting now i'm building a few we already models. have those in our cameras. They, they're called eye recognition, no, animal I, recognition. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about sty stylistically. In other words, I'm I'm putting it together a few models using Leonardo. Um, so this is of, generative again, right? Yes, it's back to generative okay. photography. So I am, or not, or blending, or you know, inter interpreting and reinterpreting, or you know, um, anyway. The the point is that if I build a model based on my fashion work of uh, you know the eighties or nineties or earlier, that that could be a model that I could use, or I could just put it out there and license that. I think that is a possibility um, for artists and creators or companies to make money. I mean, basically, small models that are very easily integrated. They say you don't need much more than 100 images to create a really robust model. And these things do not need to be, you know, 80 megapixels per image. They could be very small. And so they'll, you know, they'll fit in a phone. They'll fit in most of our hardware very, very easily. Well, what do you and mean by you? creating a model, Jeremiah? Sorry, I don't, it, I don't know it, what you mean by that. Training words, a model. Training, training a model. A model. Training a model instead of a uh, LLM, a large language model, for example, which may use billions of of input, um, or photographic models, which also may use billions, hundreds of millions of images. This may use like a hundred images, and and use the the um, it'll read those images, ascribe a kind of style to them, reinterpret them based on input and generate based on the algorithm of the particular, whether it's a DALI, open AI's model, whether it's, you know, there's going to be lots, mid-journey, of course, stable diffusion. Um, and uh, Leonardo is, is I'm, I'm on a beta for that and uh, building my own model. I want to see how that works. Um, and I, I think, you know, when you think of models that could be created based on X-rays or MRIs or CT scans based on hundreds and hundreds of thousands of CT scans that are obviously interpreted, um, they are read, the outcomes are also uh, analyzed, and you feed that and build a model for medicine, that those kinds of images can be much more profoundly um, specific than a radiologist reading it because they're drawing from at least, or, or well, I, I think so, but you need a radiologist to go, oh, it's just convincing you. <laughs> you know what, you know what, you know what I want? I, I want to give it some voice input about my ailments, where it hurts, and then it creates a virtual MRI picture of what's inside me. Yeah. Back to, <laughs> let, let's go back to tools because tools are interesting. You know, I use a, a, a large list of tools. Not every tool is used in every image, but I just pick and choose, you know, um, Luma Labs, really interesting stuff for nerfs. Um, Facetune, just to do some particular cleanups. Uh, Replicate, also really good. Dolly 2 for outpainting, though Stable Diffusion is doing a good job there too. Hugging Face, 
has you know thousands of very very interesting um, applications that one could use. Kyber for video, you know, Neuralove, Topaz, Photoshop, Lightroom, Midjourney, you know, GPT. Uh, all, all of these tools are uh, a way of adding to an image. Yeah. Um, let me let me let me let me blow your mind because one of the interesting thing that's happening right now is with um, things like Auto GPT, where we're talking language models and things. And Auto GPT is something that has just been around for a week or two, which is pretty much an uh, a self a looping, infinitely looping um, artificial intelligence machine engine that will take your your will take goals from you and a task from you and then go out and start up agents um, that will collect data and bring it back and integrate it so it's a bit of a yeah an automated ai helper um, and what this can do is it can fire up individual smaller models for um for executing tasks that are specific to that model so we're looking at uh, i think i think the one that really does it is jarvis by microsoft where mm. we're looking yes. at another another automated ai agent system and that thing is um yeah the, these things in the future will be just firing up individual individual smaller specified uh, specific models for specific tasks that will then end up being yeah, be, be, being not just one big thing, but a whole bunch of smaller things coming together. So, so. as we look at this, uh, re the future of photography, um, can we say that that um, it, it probably uh, behooves a photographer to learn the AI in their camera, number one, uh, to really understand how the camera is affecting and interpreting what they're seeing, and to be able to control it somewhat. Then on the editorial level, um, how much of the real image, and I'm just using that as a vernacular, you know, when snaps an image, it's go, that's a, that's a real photograph. It's not made up. It's real. Um, that kind of thinking in terms of what do we want to bring to that photograph? How do we want to bring out the, quote, reality of it to make it more real, less real, or dream, you know, dreamy, or integrate more of our friends into it. In other words, AutoGPT, go out, find all the pictures of my friends and group them into one big photo of them cheering. You know what I mean? Like, you, you could see that coming. I mean, th that kind of thing based on, you know, your your contact list face recognition all of that stuff and it's and it's just speculation at this point but let's revisit that in about four weeks from now <laughs> <laughs> can, can we d take this at a slightly different direction because the because i think yeah the, what about ai that's built into your camera that allows you to better capture your creative intent in camera so let's say i don't know it is a class a classic shot um of uh, a bright red London bus, right? Which, uh, and you, you've taken it on a, a slower shutter speed and you've panned it so that the bus looks like it's steady in the film, but all the background is, is nicely, nicely mushed out, right? And, and ha has motion blur on it. Now, what if I had a setting called motion blur bus on my camera, right? Uh, call it an art filter if you like. I think that's the term that Olympus uses, they, 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 have, they have what they call art filters. So what if, I, I wouldn't mind having that. It's like, oh yeah, because it's a bit of a pain and sometimes you get it great. You know, sometimes they work really well, those panning shots and other times they don't work at all for whatever reason. Uh, and it just like, just, and then you could just, without having to do the pan, you could just take the photograph and it would just say, right, there you go. There's your, there's your bus. I think you already have that. Go. I think you have that in many cameras, for example, um, you know, the classic images of waterfalls that are blurred or water that is blurred in a still landscape, you know, that I, I, I forget that there is a term for that. Where oh, the you cinema know, graphs, the cinema graphs. No, that's no, no, the, the, no, the just a, just a still picture where you know all the water is basically fluid and glowing. It's and, called a and, long exposure. 
<laughs> well, yes, but but there well, are cameras where you can just take a snap, a snap of the waterfall, and it will. Your phone, your phone can do that because it takes twelve pictures every time you take a picture. So sure. there you go. So you already have that a certain version of that anyway, and so all you need is to make the leap to the bus, and you're home free. True, true. Maybe, uh, maybe, yeah. That's a, it's a good point. Maybe we're close to that. But I like, I do like, I do like going out and taking photographs. Right, sure. I do like that. I find it yeah. a, 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 an amazingly therapeutic process. And like I said, I went to the beach today. I don't live near the beach, but we're away from home, and so, and I had an amazing time taking photographs of surfers and other things around the beach and all sorts of stuff going on. So yeah, I, I I'd love stuff in my camera like that that helps me do that sort. Of thing that would be a good result for me and it will probably sneak up on you without you even noticing i mean we, we've seen this example lightroom for example i've uh, i use lightroom to edit product photos and these kind of things and uh, the moment they integrated ai it manifested itself by being able to simply select a subject on one click and have a good mask that you can and it use does which it i use really it, it, well it, it does, does a good it. job and it it really helps me speed up my workflow and i at this, at this point i don't care if it's ai or any other magic but it helps me do a good job so we will have these kind of tools and they will sneak up on us without us, us knowing noticing because the well, companies will not always bring out the big fanfare when they have a new AI feature. That will just be features. They will just have a different technology underlying. Or you're going to be able to purchase um, plugins for your camera. Oh, yeah. Specific, that will come. you know, blur bus plugin. You know what blur, I mean? Well, blur bus plugin. That's a good title for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> or a band. <laughs> it probably is a good time. Do you know? I, or, or maybe the camera is smart enough to recognise that actually, if you're doing a panning shot, that it wants you to that that you know it's learned that you like taking those sort of shots, and it automatically you don't have to change any settings because the camera goes, ah, oh, right, I've got a gyro inside me, and I know that I'm panning side to side. Therefore, I know I need to slow the shutter to a fifteenth because that's how we're going to get this shot that that Adrian wants to make. Now, and would, of course, and, and of course, right, it will tell your camera what you want. Where the camera automatically altered its settings. Yeah, you will tell it. That's yeah, that's what yeah, I want to. I want a blur bus photo, and the camera will know what to do. Please. Yes, uh, you know that that's all coming. And 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 I have a question: Would you guys want a single tool that does all, or would you want separate tools? It, it will be it will be you you will have your assistant to talk to and that assistant will take care of acquiring all the tools that you need for a task so it's, Auto. <laughs> it's it's your it's your it's your single stop interface which will just go out and spider out and figure out how to do things for you so so if you're editing and you have a, a real you know a realistic photograph and you want yeah. to extend it into a panorama you'll just go uh, take this landscape and make a panorama, and here's the format. And it give me will give me five different examples, and I'll choose the best one. Yeah, yeah sure. and integrated with the photo that you took, and it will be a panorama. Now, is that is that an image that you took or created? You know, uh, uh, that's 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 so. that's a that's an answer we'll have to find in a different episode because yeah. it is Two. time for <laughs> our picks now. <sighs> Let's see, what did we bring? Adrian, you brought us something useful. I did. Something I was using today, in fact, which is why it's my pick of the week. Um, so uh, I have a set of filters, len lens filters, you know, a circular polarizer, an NDA, an ND1000, you know, all of, all of these sorts of things. Um, and uh, I happen to have recently picked up a set from a brand called Earth, U-R-T-H. And the, uh, the reason I'm recommending these or using them as my pick of the week is that they are magnetized. So you don't have to screw them in and screw them out. You have one base one, which is literally just a ring. Yeah, there's no filter in it. And you screw that into the filter ring on your lens. And then you just drop them in. They're magnetic and they're lovely. So a circular polarizer, instead of being a, being a really fiddly thing to get in and off because they're so thin and you can never get hold of the grip to get it to, to wind it in and out. Um, actually, it's just a single piece of metal and a single thing. And, and because it's magnet, you just it just rotates in the magnetic base. 
um, and and it's just much e much easier to use. And yeah. and they all stack together in a little stack, so you don't need boxes and filters for them because they come with it. Yeah, they 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 stack in a little um, magnetic stack with, with magnets are magic. <laughs> magnets uh, are magic. I own I own some of their filters, non the non magnetic, very high quality and very 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 good filters. I all have right. the adjustable yeah, with ND. The, you, it's really good. So yeah, so yeah, I haven't got an adjustable ND, but I, but I, that doesn't bother me because you don't because it's so quick to just <laughs> yeah pull one off and drop the next one on. It doesn't really so it it I, I'm, it's the first set of magnetic filters I've ever had, and I'm I just loving it. You can see the smile on my face, right? I do. Right. These like, things oh. put a smile on my face. <laughs> All right, let me let me bring up mine. It has nothing to do with AI. Well, there might be some AI built in. Um, what is your first uh, the first image in front of your inner eye when I when I say the word Mickey Mouse camera? <laughs> Expense, <laughs> money. Well, well, <laughs> well my first <laughs> up to this point, my first thought was like plastic, colorful for children. You buy them at Disneyland. They take yeah. I don't know. F f 24 pictures on film and you dispose of them at the end that kind of a thing because that's what i grew up with as a kid that were mickey mouse cameras um but yes you you of course hit the nail on the head we're talking expensive here um the new leica there's a they they do this thing where they um they they replace the leather part of the camera where you hold it with weird materials and things and make special editions and they have just brought out a uh, a real a bargain, I would say, of a Q2 that is now the, a Walt Disney camera, 100 years Walt Disney. Um, the Q2 with a Mickey Mouse um, comic, comic um, painter. What, what else? Draw, drawing drawings of Mickey Mouse on it. So more of a high end uh, product, uh, and I, it's I, I, it's a bargain. <laughs> we're talking we're talking some six hundred no six thousand. Dollars, just the body. Uh, though on your other podcast, the funniest thing that <laughs> your your interviewee said, I forget his name, but he said, "Oh, this is really, really good. You'd never have to worry about this camera being stolen." Which is true because you will not. If you steal it, you will not be able to sell it because there will there will only be five hundred of it. So anyway, there you go. Well, though. Uh, the Q2, as you guys have it's said a great it many, camera. many times, it, it's my go-to camera. It's the best camera I've ever had by far. Uh, I, I love this machine. It's so if you loved, beautiful. if you loved that machine, and if you loved Disney, this would be <laughs> the perfect, the perfect camera for you. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah, you brought us. You're the only one of the three of us who brought something AI related. Well, since we're talking about tools, and this, this is not specific. Um, to AI, though it's very, very useful. This is a um, Topaz Lab make a series of really effective uh, tools. This one um, does enhancement. It does blow up. They, they, they upraising, upraising, um, adjusting. Sometimes they'll fix a face. They're, they're they're just a very, very innovative company that. Um, is very very dedicated to quality and, and to um, AI, using AI in in, in doing this. Um, I can't wait till I see what they do over the next few years. I mean, the video enhancer is quite new, um, but uh, they are and they don't overuse the AI qualities, and you get to adjust and 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 tune it, and and there's so many tools to make it. Um, invisible, as it were. Um, it's also interesting to see when you apply this, like they say, you know, don't sharpen in Photoshop, do your sharpening at the very end. So learning when to use a tool is as important as what tool to use. And um, I highly recommend Topaz. All right. So... AI in photography, you will be assimilated by a blur bus plugin. How about that? So, awesome. 
It's an interesting future we're we're navigating towards, and uh, if we've been right with our assumptions here, that that'll the future will tell. And I th I would really venture the the guess that a lot of that future will arrive sooner than we think. Yeah. So I love the fact anyway. that you chose to use the word navigate there, Chris. I, I th th that's very positive, as if there was actually you know uh, uh, everybody had talked about it and agreed on a plan, and and we're going together into the future, holding hands and singing. I'd like to teach the world to see. That's my utopia, and that's what we'll leave you with. We will be back in a week from now, possibly. And uh, until then, you can find us at thefutureofphotography.com. Everyone, take care and bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.